Welcome and good morning to you. My name is Moses Barrios and my pronouns are he, him, and his. And I am an indigenous American of Mayan descent. And I am so glad you are joining us this morning. If you are here for the first time, whether on campus or online, you must know a few things. Firstly, you are welcome, you are loved, you are safe, and God is well pleased with you. A special shout out to all of our mothers, all those who are here, no longer here, all the complexities that go into mothering. We recognize you on this morning. It was an early Sunday winter evening in East Los Angeles when I walked into a home where the living room was filled with many family members and friends. Some were mourning, others were weeping. I greeted the family members as I was directed into the back room where I found a group of siblings weeping over their mother who had just passed away. I sat with them, comforted them with gentle pats on their shoulders and on their backs I listened, I observed, I waited, I prayed with them, offered words of encouragement, of solace, and blessed their mother's body and soul until they were ready to return to the living room with the rest of the family and friends. Now this was a strong Roman Catholic Latino community and if you know anything about that community, those are people of great faith. This woman was someone's mother, someone's grandmother, someone's aunt and sister and friend. They appreciated my time, my presence, and attentively listened to all my words of comfort and hope. See, it was not so much about me. All they wanted to hear was God's voice. All they wanted to do was to listen to Jesus and to follow Jesus. So I did what any pastor would do. I shared some Bible passages and told them about Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God with us. I told them about Jesus and how he told his disciples, Do not fear, for I am with you until the end. And I shared with them the, what the book of Romans says, that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. They all nodded in agreement with tears in their eyes. They all nodded in agreement with grief on their face. Certainly a time like that, we can all imagine having tears in our eyes and grief in our faces. So I prayed for everyone and blessed them and sent them off with God's goodness and love. But when I returned to my car was the moment that I was moved to tears myself. But not tears of sadness and grief, but tears of hope, of trust, and of life. Somehow, I came out of that home with more hope, more trust, more life than I had walked in with. Somehow, a moment of grief and sorrow had become a moment of hope and life for me. That's the day I discovered language to describe such a feeling, such a sense, such holiness, shall we say. Because I could feel it, I could see it, I could sense it. I knew that deep down inside that this kind of life, that God's life, is not something you wait upon, but is something available this very moment. I've titled today's sermon, You Already Know Who It Is. Because today's wisdom derives from John's Gospel, and you read this gospel, we just read it. John situates the scene very vividly. It was during the festival of dedication, or you might know it as Hanukkah, the given Jewish name, but it was also known as the festival of lights. 
hence the burning of eight candles of eight lights during Hanukkah. But John describes this encounter happening at Solomon's porch, which was known as this covered space at the entrance of the temple, with rows and rows of colonnades, or these magnificent pillars that were like 40 feet tall. In such a space as that is where rabbis would teach their students the doctrines of the faith. But during this wintry day, in such openness and freedom, is where Jesus is encircled by the Jews. Now, certainly the interaction is quite fascinating. They ask Jesus, how long will you test our patience? If you are the Christ, just tame, tell us plainly, right? Perhaps this Jewish opposition is attempting to criminalize Jesus, to somehow get Jesus in trouble with the law, so to charge him with incriminating words. But Jesus so cleverly responds, saying, I have already told you who I am. Now, whether Jesus had made a public proclamation of who he was is questionable, because up to that point, John's Gospel does not talk about that. But up to this point, his revelation had been made quietly and silently, and I would say privately, to the Samaritan woman. But it had not been made public. And here is where I think the image we get this morning of Jesus as a shepherd and a Messiah evokes something that did not exist in antiquity at this point. The Jews just could not comprehend such an image. This can't be the Christ. This can't be the Messiah, the Anointed One. He's just a shepherd, they may have thought. Conventionally, this Christ, this Messiah, lived vastly different than other Messiahs. He does not have power over his enemies. He does not want to raise war against his enemies. Instead, this Messiah is like a shepherd. Do you know what a shepherd was in antiquity? You see, a shepherd in antiquity or in first century Palestine was considered to be low class. It was considered to be uh, religiously unclean, unimportant, shall we say. After all, the youngest boy in the family would become the shepherd of the sheep and the job was passed on from older to younger sibling until the youngest became the family shepherd. If you remember the Hebrew narrative, when prophet Samuel comes to anoint the next king, the Lord tells him to anoint David. Well, David was the youngest of eight sons who was out in the fields, forgotten and taking care of the sheep. You see, this Messiah loved like a shepherd, lived like a shepherd. He was about self-giving. He was about self-sacrificing, and that led him to the cross. Still, the Jews somehow already had the impression, already had the sense that Jesus was the Messiah. How can one not tell who he was? His signs and wonders alone should give it away. However, Jesus goes on to offer more hints, more openings for these Jews, saying, you don't believe because you don't belong to my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. They know me, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never die. No one will ever snatch them from my hand. Now, in this moment, here is where wisdom enters the room. Here is where the, the universal truth of the Holy Scriptures, the language of the Scriptures, enters the room. And so I encourage you to open your heart, your mind, your soul to the Holy Spirit this morning. That you would bring about your worries and concerns, your doubts, your fears, the things that make you feel like God is far and not close, the things that make you feel like I'm not sure what's coming next, your, your decisions, the things that are on your mind this morning. This is where we bring them. This is where we bring them to the feet of God. Because today's wisdom is for all the early adopters. The ones who can quickly perceive, discern, and identify the moment, the person, the thing, and step in without 
any trepidation. Today's wisdom is for the misfits, the risk takers, the trendsetters, shall we say, of this world. And here is the wisdom. Eternal life releases us from the littleness of earthly life. Did you hear me? I'll say that again. Eternal life releases us from the littleness of earthly life. Let me try to explain this to you the best that I can. Jesus, the Messiah, the shepherd, promises eternal life for all who step in without hesitation or trepidation. But I must acknowledge that this word, eternal life, is one of those terms that carries numerous meanings. It has been used in the church to manipulate, to coerce people into a narrow understanding of salvation and of living. But what about we expand the meaning of eternal life, this promise from Jesus that frees us from the things that become so important in this world that frees us from the things that are given too much power on this earth and those things become small and insignificant in the view of God's life, of eternal life. Because we all know, we've all sensed it, we have all have seen it, that eternal life is magnificent, it is beautiful, it is fulfilling, it releases us and we don't need to grasp on so tightly to the things of this world, to the things of this earth. Are you hearing me? Eternal life means that death has no part in us. In other words, those who step into the promise will never truly know death. Am I getting too theological for you? Because death from earthly life is simply the beginning of heavenly life. Thus, making life on earth merely a step towards the next life, from life to life, from glory to glory. But if this is true, then why does one hold on so tightly to the things of this world? Why do we allow the littlest of things of this world to consume us? Why do we give so much power to the insignificant things of this earth? You see, the security that we have with eternal life is that no one will ever snatch those who step into the promise from the hands of Jesus, from the hands of God. And though pain, suffering, tragedy, grief will come, and it will come, still you will sense the secure arms of God holding you because no one will snatch you from the hands of God. And eternal life is something that one does not wait upon. It is not something that only happens when we get to heaven. Eternal life is available now on earth in front of all of those who step into the promise. This sermon is for the early adopters, the trendsetters and the misfits. But let me pause here for a moment. Because although the signs of Jesus were evident... He did, in fact, open the eyes of the blind. He did, in fact, open the ears of the deaf. He healed and performed signs and wonders that only a Messiah can do, that only a Christ can do, and still some could not perceive or discern who he was. Now, how is that possible? Although Jesus spoke with wisdom, with conviction, with authority, he announced a new law, a new imagination into an old Hebrew law, declared himself the Messiah, the Christ, and still some could not identify him as the one. They were not early adopters. They were not trendsetters. But I guess what I'm saying to you this morning is that these Jews... They're questioning the way they approached Jesus. These Jews already knew who Jesus was. They knew him very well. They already had a feeling and a sense of who Jesus was, but decided not to follow. And in many ways, you and I are a lot like these Jews. We can identify who Jesus is. We know very well who Jesus is, but yet... We choose not to follow. 
And you know why we choose not to follow? Because it takes too much patience to follow. It takes too much time to follow. It takes too much work to follow. It takes too much trust and too much hope and too much waiting to follow Jesus. Instead, what's, what we want is the same thing that Jews want. Just plainly speak, Jesus. Tell us exactly what you want. But my impression is that even if Jesus would speak to us plainly, and we would clearly understand it all, that we would still move with hesitation and trepidation. Because we don't like to follow. We like to lead. And this morning, in many ways, we are those same Jews asking the same question that we already know the answer to. Because I can speak about this kind of understanding after, I would say to you, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of hours, maybe, of studying, of praying, of research, of writing about the systemic ills and sins of the American Christian church. Oh, if I can tell you everything I discovered, these burdensome historical systems that were created, adopted, and implemented into the church. I discovered the sins of consumerism, the sins of racism, the sins of hyper-individualism were at the forefront of the reasoning for disunity in Sunday worship. Dr. Martin Luther King mentioned some of these same systemic issues during his time on earth, and still today, they continue. Sunday morning remains the most segregated hour in America, but I would argue that Sunday morning has become and is becoming the most church-abandoned hour in America. Abandoned by most young people, by most college students, by most young couples, by most young families with children, vacated by most of the LGBT community, deserted by several communities of color, black, brown, and indigenous, abandoned because those who are inside the church are just not following Jesus. Despite this harsh analysis and interpretation, God's call to the communities that have been oppressed and rejected, those who have been made to feel like they don't belong, like they don't carry the image of God on their faces. Our call is to still follow Jesus, despite the ills, the burdens, the sins of the church. In fact, I would argue that we are called to take back the true church of Jesus Christ, to reclaim what has been distorted, manipulated, to heal and reconcile that which is very sick, very ill, that which is broken. But it pains me to say it's not just the church that's broken. Our society is broken as well. We are witnesses to yet another broken system over the last couple weeks, which have been distorted, manipulated, and turned into something puzzling. The leaked draft opinion of the Supreme Court on an apparent overturning of a woman's human right that has been around for nearly 50 years. And instead of centering my thoughts on this issue, which many are doing, and rightfully so, rather I want to point to you something that is even more lamenting and even more saddening. That the Supreme Court, the group charged with being the final arbiters of law, who are tasked to assure Americans of the equal justice under the law, who should offer truth and nothing but the truth, that they are no different than the broken political systems and groups of our country. Stories being leaked like gossip. Judges who are easily persuaded by personal biases and agendas. How are we ever to find and discover absolute truth when our justices stand on one side or the other? If our justices are conservative or liberal, this kind of duality is not helpful. It is not promising for the world. How are we ever to discover true life? Our society is broken. Our church is ill. And yet Jesus continues to speak cryptically today 
oftentimes answering our questions with a question. And we expect God to speak to us so clear, so certain, but the reality is that all that we are left with is hope, faith, and trust. There is no certainty, but we still have confidence. Everything is a mystery, but we have promises. We don't have a signed contract by God, but we have hope. We do trust that the eternal outweighs the earthly, and we follow Jesus. But let me ask you something. How does one follow Jesus in 2022? Well, let me ask you, how often do you speak to Jesus? How often do you converse with God? We call that prayer. How often do you listen to Jesus, sit in silence? I mean, how else will we recognize the voice of Jesus if we don't listen? How often do you accompany Jesus, serve alongside of the divine, love people, care for people, serve the church? Because following Jesus actually requires chasing, pursuing, moving, acting, actual seeking of Jesus. If you want to follow Jesus, then you are to seek Jesus. Jesus says to us this morning, I have already told you who I am. You already know who it is. The shepherd who gives his life for his sheep went to the cross lovingly and died for us, takes away our shame, our failures, mistakes, our transgressions, gives us his forgiveness, his successes, and his righteousness, and was raised on the third day to give us liberation. Liberation for what? See, I would say liberation to step into the promise of eternal living that you would receive eternal life in this very moment. Free from the littleness of the earthly things, free from the earthly expectations and the earthly worries. Come and listen, come and follow, come and dance, come and step into the promise that Jesus offers you. All things being made new, all things being put back together, healed and reconciled. Oh, how we pray, Holy Trinity, that you would make us followers, that we would follow what our eyes already show us, what our hearts already sense, what we already know deep down inside. Make us early adopters trendsetters of your eternal life here and now not something we wait for but eternal life here and now we step into it we step into it we step into it word of god and word of life and we all say together thanks be to god would you pray with me this morning